Hello, I'm Norm Stevens. I'd like to tell you a little about myself, where I came from, and then a bit about my early life at sea. I only really knew one of my grandparents. Both my grandfathers died before I was born. My dad's father seemed reluctant to share details of his personal life, judging by the difficulty tracing him in the old census records. Now, here's a photograph of Grandad. That's Grandad Stevens. I never saw it when I was growing up. I discovered it with others amongst my mum's things when I was sorting out after she died. I don't recall seeing many photographs of my dad's family, and it may be that Grandad's secretiveness was passed on to my dad. He also really mentioned his family. Oh dear, there are so many things that I later realised I would have liked to have asked, but I was too young to know how to. I'm hoping not to make the same mistake with my kids. Here's another picture of Grandad Edward Henry. We, we always had to call him Edward Henry because there are so many Edwards in the family. I believe he has the look of someone who wouldn't stand any nonsense, a product of the Victorian age. I think he was a very honourable man. Dad told me that his mother came from a village called Kensworth in Hertfordshire. The county borders were realigned in 1897 to put the village in Bedfordshire, but apparently Grandma would have none of that newfangled nonsense. To her, Kensworth was always in Hertfordshire. Dad was 12 when his father died, and I think he was closer to his mother. He named our house Kensworth after his mother's village. Here's Grandma Jane, Jane Crawley Hall near Holland. She was the youngest of nine, whose family we have traced back four generations to 1715. She died when I was only 14 and a half months old, yet I still have a distinct recollection of a remote but kindly face peering at me as I lay in my pram. This is the only photo I have of her. It also came to light amongst my mum's things. I got to learn much more about my mum's family. Here are Grandad, Grandad Harry Howard and Grandma Mary Harriet Nay Latham. This photo used to sit on, my, on the mantelpiece in my grand's house and she'd tell me stories about how they both used to live in and manage a public house, which seemed very romantic to my five-year-old ears. She told me my mum was born in the Queen's arms and thinking of Queen Victoria, I thought that was very grand. Mm -hmm. I grew up knowing my dear old grand very well. She and my mum's sister May would often come to stay with us. Here they are in about 1945. Mum is on the right. And here's another one of Gran. She used to spend hours patiently letting me beat her at cards. We played fish. You know, I think that's the only game she could really understand. Of course, I only really remember my mum and dad from when they were in their mid to late 30s. Here they are as they were when I was growing up but two pictures of them when they were younger I carried with me all the time after I went to sea. Dad showing medals he won in gym gymnastics and Mum at around age 20. So, about my early life. Here's the house where I was born. I spent my first ten months there. This shot actually is from Google. I only returned there once out of curiosity, but I believe the exterior is very, very little changed since 1927. Then we moved to the semi-rural village of Nasing. It's only 17 miles north of London, but pretty much in the country in those days. Here's a photo of Nasing Church. I took this one in 1985. My brother Len, who died in 1935, has his grave there. This photo I took the last time I returned in 2008, and this, taken on the same visit, is typical of the old village known as Upper Nasing. Now here is the house called Kensworth, as it was when we lived there until I went to sea in 1944. The inset shows the big privet hedge that grew all along the front of either side, where now there are neighbouring houses. You can also see where the bedroom was that my brother and I shared, with a window looking out to the west. The house was then only one of about four in that part of a dead end and gravel road that petered out into a hayfield. It had the postal address just Kensworth, Nasing, Essex. No house number, no street name, and no postcode. And the postman knew where we lived. We had a phone, unlike many people there. 
There was no dial and you had to jiggle the earpiece cradle to get an operator's attention and then ask for the number you wanted. Our number was Nazing 40. By contrast, this is what it looks like now. Apart from the garden and the absence of lawn on one side and our fruit orchards on the other, the exterior has not much changed, but I think the character has. In the 1930s, there was a field on the other side of the road, and on the other side of that was the old road to Upper Nazing, and, and there also was the nearest pub called the Crooked Billet. As kids, we used to listen to the sounds of merriment coming from the public bar, but of course, we were never allowed to go in. And what of my brother and me and life at Kentworth? Here we are standing by our old Armstrong Sidley in 1930. This was a wonderful old car where we'd jump up and down on the back seat in excitement when Dad drove us to the seaside. You know, no no seatbelts required then. We had a big garden to play in, and this shows me posing on the lawn in about 1935. You can see the big hedge I mentioned. There's another house there now. Here on the lawn is Lynn with me and the old heavy wheelbarrow. We spent hours playing in the oak tree and the old shed you can see just behind us. We found a way to clamber onto the roof of the shed and then grab a branch and climb up into the tree. It's sad to think of it being chopped down and bulldozed out of the way. Dad made us a pond in a rockery at the back of the house where I would paddle and sail my toy boat. Len had a real boat. Playing with that in the seaside was great fun, though I never got to go out in it very much. I think Len didn't would trust me. Our summer holidays, we went to a place called Jaywick near Clacton on the east coast of Essex. Here, Len and I would spend all day on the beach or in the sea. Len died in 1935. He died of septicemia. This was probably a school photo of him taken shortly before then. When I was 13, in 1941, I went to the Thames Nautical Training College, HMS Worcester. Being wartime, the college had been evacuated from, that, from the Thames to a country manor in Kent. However, the ship itself remained moored at Greenhithe, and with her was the famous tea and wool sailing clip of the Cuddy Sark. Here they are when I was a cadet there. Groups of us would go down to the Cuddy Sark on day trips for practical seamanship instruction, learning, amongst many other things, what it's like to go aloft and out onto the yards of a sailing ship. Of course, that was easy because the ship wasn't at sea, it was just moored in the Thames. One summer holiday, half a dozen of us spent a week living on board. It was a very exciting time. I graduated and left the Worcester after three years and joined the Blue Funnel shipping line as an apprentice. <laughs> Look, I earned 12 pounds in my first year. My first trip was to South and East Africa. The ship was called the Menelaus, and we left Liverpool as a Commodore ship in a slow-moving convoy, thankfully avoiding German raiders and U-boats in mid-Atlantic. Oh, that was my first time in the tropics. It was a wonderful life. Here's the Menelaus, and I think this is the Table Bay in Cape Town. For wartime security, it was forbidden to make any sort of record of our ship movements, and so Unable to take photographs, I have nothing but my memories to go on. All the blue funnel ships were named from Greek mythology, and you may suppose that the proper name for that ship should have been Menelaus, but he was always known as Menelaus. That was on the basis that Father Christmas is never called Santa Claus. My second ship was a Liberty ship. We sailed 21 trips between Tilbury and Antwerp, three to Cherbourg and one to Hamburg. And this was from November 1944 to September 1945. We carried tanks, armoured vehicles, trucks, anything to be used for the invasion into Germany. On the return trip, we carried all the bust-ups. Those are the damaged but repairable vehicles. This, of course, was very much a part of the war effort, especially as after BE Day in May 1944, we still had to dodge enemy mines laid in the North Sea. Here, here's the glorious Sam Ness as she was then. It was a happy ten months of my life and really quite exciting stuff for a 17-year-old. Following that, I spent another ten years at sea and after finishing my apprenticeship, I worked on Australian ships around the coast, the Pacific Islands and across the Pacific. In all, I served on 20 ships, made many friends 
and had some memorable experiences both ashore and afloat. One of the smallest, oldest and certainly one of the least comfortable ships was the 1051 tonne ship SS Uruma. Perversely, that still brings nostalgic memories. We carried sugar from North Queensland to Port Adelaide and then loaded wheat from Port Brickaby and the Spencer Gulf. There being no wharfies in places like Minlakawi, the bags were brought down and the cargo worked by the local farmers, while the ship's crew, that's including the mates and engineers, lent a hand loading the ships. It created a satisfying feeling of camaraderie. Years later, I travelled back to recall old times and found that found this, uh, a cairn had been built with a plaque and a bit erected in Menlakaui to commemorate the local community and included those involved in the coastal shipping trade. I went on to other occupations and other travels, but these, these things I remember with great pleasure.